this day that you've blessed us with, a day that wasn't even promised to us, and yet here we stand before you, a people at the ready to just offer up fruit of our voices, of our lips, Lord, that uh, our worship would be heartfelt, that it would be um, well-pleasing unto you, God. You deserve nothing less than our absolute best. So we want to give that to you here, and we trust, Lord, that our hearts would be ready so that we might hear and receive from you today. We ask and trust that by your Holy Spirit, your word would go out with power. We pray these things in Jesus' name, and everyone said, all right. As we wait upon the Lord, we will wait upon the Lord, we will wait upon the Lord. Strength will rise as we wait upon the Lord, we will wait upon the Lord, we will wait upon the Lord. Our God, you reign forever, our hope, our strength. Indeed, Lord, we are just blessed to know that as we do uh, choose to wait upon you, Father, that our strength will be renewed. And not only that, but we will mount on the wings of eagles, Lord. We can soar. And we don't get need to get caught up and flap our wings like sparrows, but just spread our wings and just soar under the wind of your spirit, Lord, as you carry us and you continue to move in our lives. We thank you. We thank you even as we acknowledge your presence here in this place, Lord. May it cause us to just be attentive to what you have for us here this afternoon. In Jesus' name. You can be seated. You are 
And dear Lord, we acknowledge that <coughs> there's just absolutely no question in our minds you are a miracle worker. You're definitely a promise keeper, Lord. And, and we just cry out to you even as we continue to worship and adore you that you just meet us in a powerful way today. The crowns before the Lamb of God and sing. You are worthy of it all. You are worthy of it all. For from you are all things, and to you are all things. You deserve the glory. of it all. praises and it gives us just great joy to just acknowledge that you are majesty and you're the king you are our lord and we worship you father we gather here together that we might sing your name light of the world the 
So highly exalted, glorious in heaven above. Only you came to the earth you created, all for love's sake became poor. Here I am to worship. Lord, gathered here in your name that we might worship you. The beautiful, lovely, sweet name of Jesus. And we adore you, Lord. And we're just blessed and thankful that you've prepared a, a message for us here this afternoon. That, that we might just open our hearts and our ears and our eyes. And that we would see through the, through the lenses of your word and inspired by your Holy Spirit. We ask that you would speak to us here this afternoon. In Jesus' name, and everyone said, Amen. amen. afternoon. Oh, that's kind of weak, guys. Come on. <laughs> Good, afternoon. Good afternoon. All right. Happy Memorial Day weekend. I'm glad you all made it out. I know it's rough Memorial and then at two in the afternoon. So I'm glad that you guys came out because you wanted to hear those six things, huh? Those six good things that we could be doing. A couple quick announcements. Uh, so our normal things we have we have uh, midweek prayer on Wednesdays. If you guys need prayer requests, put them in the back. If you want to join us, always an invitation there to be a part of that. It's a sweet time. We're just seeking the Lord together. Uh, men's study Tuesday, women's study Thursday. And um, a couple things next weekend is communion. And then afterwards, we go to the park. So if you uh, be prepared, if you want to come join us, grab a bite to eat and join us over there. And then um, 
Also, yesterday we did something special, something that we take very seriously. Um, it was our first kind of laying hands on another brother that we recognize as being a pastor. And that was uh, Pastor, we'll call him now Pastor Martin from the Spanish ministry. So, yeah, that was like two years since we started because Pastor Tito's known him um, for years. He's had a good reputation and character. Uh, and so um, I had the opportunity to come yesterday in front of the Spanish ministry and shared with them how seriously we do take that. It wasn't a light thing. And so uh, the characters involved. Uh, so we went through 1 Timothy chapter 3 and the character qualities that are required to be uh, an elder, a pastor. And then we also looked at the calling uh, from John 10, which is to lead, to uh, sacrifice, to feed, and to uh, protect the flock. And so in 1 Thessalonians, we're called to recognize those that labor and are over us in the Lord and to respect them, give them honor, but it's because their role is to love and sacrifice for the sheep, not to dominate or to rule over. It wasn't about bringing him up, saying, now listen to whatever he says and serve him. It's the other way around. The, this, these guys are here to serve the body and to love them because of, and be an example in their character and their lifestyle. And so we brought him up and we laid hands on him and prayed. And so a great thing to see. And so... Uh, and an elder is an elder, a pastor is a pastor. I don't see in scripture the word assistant pastor or anything like that. So elder, overseer, pastor are interchangeable terms. We've talked about that before. And so he uh, is one of the leaders here of the flock at Calvary Cerrito. So continue to pray for him. And then this, it's Memorial Day. And so it, it, uh, tomorrow, and so it's Memorial Weekend. So it is time to remember those that have sacrificed their lives in the service of this country. And I can't always think of Memorial Day, too, is also, man, what an example of Christ who sacrificed himself for humanity. And so anybody in here have someone they love that died in the service of our country, even if it's a relative, a grandparent, or somebody down the line? Anybody? Leilani, you do? Oh, I'm sorry. I thought you raised your hand. So. Your brother's in the service. Lynn? No, she's waving at somebody. <laughs> you guys are throwing me off, man. What's going on here? <laughs> Everybody's saying hi to each other all of a sudden. Hey, I mean, uh, yeah, yeah, right here. Yeah. So, um, so, yes, you know, uh, so it is it's something we want to do. We want to pray for the families of those uh, that have lost loved ones in the service of our country and actually for our active military. No, Leilani's brother actually is in active military right now. Anybody else have loved ones that are serving the country right now? You saying hi or okay? Wait, okay, you guys do who? Okay, Alex. Okay, good deal. Yeah. What's that? Ammon. Okay. How's that related? Okay, cousin. All right, all right. Gil. Okay. All right, all right. So as we pray, lift them, just have them on your minds, and we want to pray for protection over them. Uh, but also, mainly, this is in memory of those that have given their lives and in support of their families and stuff. So let's take a time and pray. So, Lord, we do thank you for your goodness. We thank you, one, that you're the ultimate example of sacrificial love. And that's what's in our heart. That's what drives a lot of people to serve in the military and are willing to sacrifice themselves because they're made in the image of their creator. And you put a sacrificial love as part of your fingerprint in your creation. And so, Lord, we thank you for, one, you dying for our sins and sacrificing yourself for that eternal war of our souls. But we also practically thank you as well for those that have given us the freedom to worship you. They've given their lives so that could happen. And so we pray for their families that, Lord, you would bring comfort to them on this day as they remember and celebrate their lives and their sacrifice, Lord. I pray, too, it wouldn't be an overwhelming day. I pray for those that lost loved ones that didn't know you, that you would use this day to bring the hope into their lives of salvation, that they would have hope for the future. For those that have loved ones that did give their life but knew you, that they would remember but also rejoice that they will see them again one day. So I pray that the grief will not be overwhelming, but that you would bring comfort to all those families right now, we pray, Lord. And we pray for all those who are actively putting their lives on the line for the freedom of this country. We pray that you would bring protection. We pray that you would bring strength. We pray that many would come to know you even on this day or this weekend of Memorial Day, God. 
So now we also just pray for the rest of our service, Lord. We pray that you'd prepare our hearts to receive your word. I pray that you would teach, that you would give understanding and clarity, that we would walk away with specific things to do in our walk with you, but also that we would walk away knowing you better, that you would use the word to reveal yourself, that we would have a real encounter, not just a list of things to do. So we commit this time to you, and we ask this in Jesus' name, amen. All right, so the little ones can be dismissed, the youth and the little ones with Diana and Josh. You're going to stay here? <laughs> right. Scott never misses a chance for a short joke on himself, so... <laughs> So I said, when the little ones could go, he says, oh, I'll stay here. So I didn't make that joke. He did. All right. Good deal. So we're going to be in Acts 1, and we're going to be finishing chapter 1 today. So we're going to be 9 to verse 26. So we took a little time in the first eight verses as we looked at this important, the foundation, the background of the book of Acts, Luke, when he wrote it, why he wrote it. But we also left off with this last command that Jesus gave the disciples to wait in Jerusalem until the Holy Spirit came. And so the coming, the promise of the Holy Spirit. And last week we looked at that relationship we have with the Holy Spirit and what it should look like as we walk in that. And so if you didn't catch it, you could go on Facebook or YouTube and, and watch last week. I think that is important for us to all understand. Today we're going to go and look at a few things that the church was doing while they waited for this promise, while we, they waited for the coming of the Holy Spirit. Waiting doesn't mean necessarily doing nothing. We don't do nothing while we wait. Waiting in the Lord is often active, and there's things that we can be doing while we do that. When it comes to ourselves, we're going to learn some things while we're waiting on the Lord, while we're waiting to hear from him, while we're waiting for direction some of you might be in a season like that. Some of you will be in a season. We come and go often through seasons like that through our lives. And so we're going to look at a few things that they did and we could do while we're in that period of waiting and preparing ourselves to receive. Before we get to that, that's going to be picking up in verse 12. We're going to look at the ascension of Christ in verses 9 to 11. Let's read those verses. Now, when he had spoken these things, while they watched, he was taken up. And a cloud received him out of their sight. And while they looked steadfastly towards heaven as he went up, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel, who also said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus, who was taken up from you into heaven, will so come in like manner as you saw him go into heaven. So why do you think Jesus went this way? Why do you think he left the earth in this fashion, this dramatic fashion. Any, any thoughts on that? Why do you think he left like so definitively like this? Okay, could be, yeah, an example for sure that he's going to come. Okay. Yeah, that it won't be found here. But I think also to give some finality to his finally leaving as well. So he went in a way that it would be clear that he wouldn't necessarily be coming back right away. And that's kind of why he left in this dramatic fashion of coming up into heaven. Because think of the previous 40 days. This is now 40 days after the resurrection. And so he appeared multiple times to the disciples in various locations and occasions. And it had to happen because there had to be proof of his resurrection. And so verse 3, if you remember, it says, To whom he also presented himself alive after his suffering, suffering by many infallible proofs. We talked about how important the resurrection is. The resurrection proved that there was no more suffering. There was no more price for sin to be paid. Death no longer had to hold Jesus because he paid the penalty in full. And so the resurrection showed that the payment was made, but also the sacrifice was accepted and Jesus was who he said he was. So it, the resurrection meant a lot. So he had to show himself multiple times to prove that he actually rose from the dead. And we see many occasions where Jesus did that at one point, even up to 500 people at one time saw the resurrected Lord. 
But he would come and he would go. It's going to be a huge thing through the book of Acts, the resurrection of Jesus. It's going to be in each of the gospel presentations. There's going to be this, these couple points you're going to see repeated over and over when the gospel is presented, uh, as, and the resurrection is a huge component of that. But we would look at the end of John. You can go back there later, chapters 20 and 21, and we see multiple appearances of Jesus. Mary's at the tomb weeping, and she thinks a gardener comes, but it's Jesus, right? So he comes and ministers to her, and he leaves. In the upper room, a short period later, that same day, ten of the apostles are there, gathered together. The door is closed, and all of a sudden, Jesus just appears, right? Whoa, whoa, there he is, right? <laughs> and Jesus appears, he ministers to him, and then he goes. A week later, uh, that Thomas was missing, and so he said, ah, unless I put my hand in his, in his side and my fingers in his nail prints, I won't believe. So he was there a week later, door was closed again, Jesus appears, comes, and he go, then he goes again. They're at the Sea of Tiberias, fishing, and then somebody calls out from the shore and gives them some instructions, and then John's like, I think that's Jesus, and then they see, wow, he's here again, right? Jump out of the boat, uh, Peter does, and swims to him. He ministers to them and meets them here. The road to Emmaus, they're walking on the road, this guy just joins them. For some reason, their eyes are blinded, they eat with him in the breaking of bread, but they really, oh my gosh, Jesus, then he's gone again, right? And so could you imagine, too, walking those 40 days, wondering if you're going to see him, right? You're going to turn the corner. Is he going to be there? You're going to go to a meeting. Is he going to show up? And so kind of in expectation, man, I hope we see Jesus tonight, right? I hope physically he's going to show up because he's coming and going and appearing and not appearing. I almost picture as he's going up into heaven, the apostles watching, watching him go back, watching him go up, and then just telling the crowd, don't worry, he does this all the time. He's coming back, right? Just wait for it, wait for it. He comes and he goes, right? But then the angels appear and say, why are you staring into heaven? And it's interesting the way they, he, the angels word this. Because it seems to say here, why are you looking into heaven? He's going to come back. I would say, like, that's why we're looking into heaven. They didn't say, hey, why are you looking into heaven? He's not coming back. He says, why are you looking into heaven? He's coming back the same way. So the implication is he is coming back the same way, but not now. Because he had spoken to them on multiple occasions, if you remember, that he had to depart, and he was going. And so at, during these 40 days, he kept coming and going, and now he was gone. So that the importance of why he was leaving now hits the disciples. A couple things. If you remember in John 14, 2, he says, I'm going away, preparing them, but when I go, I'm preparing a place for you, and then I'm going to come back and get you. So now this is the time where he's going to prepare that place. Also, in this exchange, this all happened the night before Jesus was crucified in John 13 through 17, and there's this discourse he had preparing them for the opposition that was coming, but also the hope and the promise of the Holy Spirit. He was interchanging this through this whole discourse that he had with his disciples on that night before. And so a few chapters later in the discourse, he goes, look, guys, it's to your advantage that I go away. Because if I don't go, the Holy Spirit's not going to come. But when I go, I'm going to send him to you. And we read last week in that discourse he had with them all the benefits, the comfort, the helper, the, he's going to lead him into truth, all these things that the Holy Spirit is going to do after Jesus sends them. And so now no longer are they waiting to see if Jesus is coming and going, but now he's gone for now, coming back, but now we're waiting for what he said in Acts 1-8, the Holy Spirit is going to come. So now they turn their attention to the coming of the Holy Spirit. So look at that format here for a moment. Jesus is gone, and the Holy Spirit is coming, but Jesus is going to return for good, right? And so that's kind of the model he leaves, and that rhythm of these verses here leaves them and us with a twofold focus. That Jesus, they're still walking around knowing Jesus is coming back. And so there is this expectation with the disciples that Jesus is coming back. He, he said he was, and the angels even said, this is how, he's going to come back the same way that he left. And so they're walking around with that expectation. But in the meantime, knowing they had a lot to cover, the whole world was going to be, they were to be a witness to the whole world by the power of, of the Holy Spirit who Jesus promised would come when he left. And so that's with us as well. We should 
be walking around expecting even more than the disciples. Because now the gospel has gone around the world. We should be expecting the return of the Lord at any time in the same manner that he departed. But also knowing that now the Holy Spirit has come, is within us, and we should be being witnesses until the return of Jesus Christ. That truth was dominant in the disciples' lives. That's how they lived the rest of their lives. Even John, who was the longest living disciple, 60 years later is when he started his writing ministry, when he was in his 90s. And he wrote the epistles of John. He wrote the revelation of Jesus Christ. He received that vision. And the gospel of John were all written around the same time when he was in his 90s, still waiting on the Lord. Can you imagine, would you rather have been James, the first martyr in, in the, that went quick, or John that lasted 60 years, right? I, I would think John was like, Lord, I thought you were coming back a long time ago, right? It's been a hard life since you've gone. And I think even just to bless him at the end of those hard years, he gave him these fantastic revelations to give him to share with the body that we still have with us today. But interesting, they, that, that dominated him. Does that dominate your life? Could you imagine if the church, all those that are saved, were driven to live their life, not just knowing about, not just a part of their lives, but I'm expecting Jesus at any moment, and until he comes, I want to let the Holy Spirit dominate my life to be a witness to everyone the Lord leads me to. Could you imagine how powerful the church would be, how each of us individually would be? That expectation we've talked about before is left there by God, that he would return at any moment, that we would live a pure life and an urgent life. Urgent because, man, he can come back at any moment. I need to share with as many people as possible. There's so many people in my life that I know don't know him, and so there's this urgency not to put it off till tomorrow, but to take advantage of today. And purity because, man, he can come back at any moment, right? And I need to live a life that if he returned, I'm ready for that. I don't want to live a compromised life. I don't want to live a life where he would return and catch me doing something or living in a way that would dis be displeasing. So if we truly believed and lived at the forefront of our mind that Jesus could come back at any moment, and until then, at our disposal, we have the power of the Holy Spirit, how would that affect your life? Would your life change at all, or is that how you live your life? Good question to examine ourselves, for myself as well. Now, verses 12 to 26 this is what they did while they waited for the return of the Lord. And last week, I gave you homework. I gave you guys six things to look for in these next verses that they did while they waited for the Lord and that we could do, especially when we're waiting to receive direction or a word from the Lord. So did you guys find six things in there? Huh? Not six? Okay. Okay. Grammy found? Okay, I think I gave her the six, but that's, no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> We're going to test you, Grammy. That's what she's called, a Grammy back there. So I got you a special donut, a little Captain Crunch donut over there, so. All right, so let's look at what they are. So the first thing is in verses 12 and 13. It says, then they returned to Jerusalem from the mount called Olivet, which is near Jerusalem, a Sabbath day journey. And when they had entered, they went up into the upper room where they were staying. Peter, James, John, Andrew, Philip, and Thomas, Bartholomew, and Matthew, James, the son of Alphaeus, Simeon, the zealot, and Judas, the son of James. So what was the first thing they did there? Returned to Jerusalem. Returned to Jerusalem. What was that? They gathered. What, what's returning to Ju Jerusalem? What's the significance of that? Uh, you got it. So what is that? Obedience, right? Obedience. The first thing they did, uh, don't shake your head, Frank. You didn't, you didn't say anything. You're like, yeah, that's what I thought. <laughs> Putting his arms up, that's what I thought. <laughs> okay, so he, they said, wait in Jerusalem until the Holy Spirit comes, and that's exactly what they did. They waited in Jerusalem. How long did they have to wait in Jerusalem? Ten days. All right. So ten days. He walked the earth for 40. Pentecost is the day the Holy Spirit came. And so that's 10 days after the ascension of Christ before the coming of the Holy Spirit. Is that a long time, 10 days? Depends, right? 
If I say, hey, there's 10 days left of summer vacation to my kids, that's it, 10 days, right? A 10-day trip to Hawaii sounds great, except when you get there, and all of a sudden, 10 days is gone, right? It's, oh, i got to go home already, right? 10 days can go by quick. If I say, hold your breath for 10 days, that's literally an eternity, right? You're dead. If I say, don't eat for 10 days, that's a long time, right? It's doable, but that's going, going to seem like an eternity, much longer than a fun field trip to Hawaii versus not eating for 10 days. So it's all relative here. So why do they say that? Because they waited 10 days, but they didn't know it was 10 days. He didn't say, hey, I'm coming. The Holy Spirit's coming on Pentecost. Wait. He didn't say, wait, 10 days. He just said, wait. For all they knew, it could have been months before the Holy Spirit came. They had no idea when that was going to happen, so they waited. And that could have been difficult because Jerusalem, we told you, it just took faith. Jerusalem was hostile to them. Uh, Jerusalem was foreign to them. They, again, were mocked, and they stuck out like a sore thumb they were Galileans while they were in Jerusalem. So this was something that did take their faith and patience. I'm sure the first day, no problem, man. We're, we're obeying the Lord. We're here in Jerusalem. We're waiting, right? By day four or five, like, did he, he did say Jerusalem, right? Like, did we get that right? Jer Jerusalem, right? And I, okay, we'll just keep waiting. I'm sure by day eight or nine, like, man, did we really hear it from the Lord? And the enemy, I'm sure, was there like, nah, you guys are fools. You guys are putting your life on the line. He's not coming. And what if he already came and you just didn't know it? You know, you don't even know what it's supposed to look like if the Holy Spirit comes and messing with their head. And so they're probably getting impatient and getting agitated. And what do we do? But nonetheless, they hung in there. And again, that grows on us. Sometimes we feel like we have to do something uh, to expedite what the Lord said about the coming of the Holy Spirit or whatever. But they waited. God's timing is perfect. And so they hung out there. Many times, again, we're, speak, we're seeking the specific will of God for our lives. Maybe a decision we need to make, a job, a relationship. But it starts by just simply obeying what the Lord has told us to do that's right before us. In Scripture, there's the general will of God and there's the specific will of God. The general will of God is for everyone that we're to obey. I don't sit there and pray, God, should I lie about this situation? Lord, should I steal to make rent this month? Lord, talk to me, man. I don't, I'm not getting nothing from the Lord. Should I lie, Lord? Should I lie, Lord? I'm not hearing from you. Of course, we don't even ask that question. He's already told us the answer to that. So there's the general will of God where he has told us what to do clearly in his word, what we should and shouldn't do. Then there's other things specific to my life. Should I get, take this job? Should we move to this location? And so I don't find that in 1 Corinthians or anywhere. Should Jason take this job here or move here? And so we have these specific things that we need to hear from the Lord at times. The general will can become boring and mundane and repetitive as we just seek to faithfully obey all that Christ has commanded out of our love and commitment to him. The specific is exciting. It's new. It's about a change in our lives. And so we're always anxious to hear what is that. But many times, why would God give you the specific will if you're not listening or obeying the general will? And so the first step is, man, what has God asked me to do today? Am I living in obedience to what God has already told me to do? Then I could expect to hear more details about the specific will of God for my life. So again, what is God asking you to do now? Be faithful to obey that no matter what season you're in. That's a good time, too. Typically, when you're waiting, a lot of introspection goes on, doesn't it? When I'm waiting to hear from the Lord, when I need direction, there's all kinds of soul searching. Am I in sin, Lord? Am I doing everything right? And we allow the Lord to examine us. And a lot of times, I think that's why he waits. He pumps the brake on our life so that we're forced to allow him to examine and make sure we're walking in a way that pleases him. Verse 14, we see the next thing here. These all continued with one accord in prayer and supplication with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and with his brothers. So there's actually two things here. Do you guys see what those are? Prayer and one accord. Hey, Grammy's, Grammy's got something going on back there. <laughs> so yes, two things. So Kenneth's got prayer and the one accord, or unity and prayer is what they continued on. That's number two and three. First, this word, one accord, it's a unique word. It's found 14 times in the New Testament. Twelve of them are found 
in the book of Acts, and it's used as a tremendous witness, we're going to see as we go through Acts, to the lost world and the religious leaders when the church is moving in unity. The word here, is, it's a compound word, homo thumanodon. And so it's a compound word, and it means to rush along or in unison. And here's a quote from one of the lexicons. The image is almost musical. A number of notes are sounding, which while different, harmonize in pitch and tone. So picture a orchestra, each instrument doing their part, but together they form this one sound, this one stream of music. I always think when I hear that word of school of fish, uh, you ever watch those na nature channels? I like to watch those, especially the ocean ones at night when I'm, when I'm ready to go to bed. They're very soothing. And so you see the ocean life and the narrator, but those schools of fish sometimes are fascinating. You have thousands of fish, and they're all swimming together, and they'll turn on a dime, and one will turn, and, and all of them will go with it. It's, it's, uh, it's um, hypnotizing. And many times if you watch that. And so that's kind of what this word is, that they're moving all in unison, all together to produce something larger than them individually can produce. We can skim right past that, though. Yeah, they were one accord and in prayer and move on. But that's a huge thing. Remember who we're talking about here. These are the 11 apostles. If Jesus wasn't around, you get the idea that they'd be in fistfights all the time, right? They were always arguing which one of us is better, which one of us is greater. They would get into these heated exchanges that Jesus had to step in many times and instruct them. These guys had nothing in common. You l even look at the makeup. You had Matthew, who was considered a, a national traitor, a tax collector. They were despised and hated. We looked at that when we looked at Matthew early on. They essentially cut themselves off from their whole family and were a disgrace. On the other hand, you had a zealot, which were complete nationalistic. They believed in the nation of Israel and its sovereignty. And so these two guys were polar opposites of one another. And then you had everybody in between the different makeup and personality. They were really conflicted. But something was different here. They were all unified. And that brings up the question, what brings unity? Unity is brought about by humility. And what brings true humility, not false humility, but a focus on Christ instead of ourselves. So a focus on Christ will bring humility, and humility will bring true unity. These guys were broken by the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. When they saw him brutally murdered and then resurrected from the dead, this was very sobering to them. And now the finality of him leaving and them realizing we're really on our own and without him now and were commissioned for this huge task, they were broken, and they were humbled, and they saw their need for God in their lives and their dependency upon him. This is repeated, this, this same format. This is a big thing in the book of Ephesians. In chapter 4, verse 3, it says, Endeavoring, this is a command of God, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. So we're called to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. How do we do that? That's verse 3. Verse 2 is what's required for verse 3 to happen. And those are character qualities. So verse 2 produces unity. And that is with, that we were called to walk with all lowliness, gentleness, with long-suffering, bearing with one another in love. And so let me read what those things are. First thing is lowliness having a humble opinion of oneself, a deep sense of one's moral littleness. Humility is essential to unity as pride really destroys unity. And so the first part is they walked around in lowliness or humility. That also produces gentleness or meekness. Meekness produces unity as well. Meekness is not weakness. It's not being trampled on or looked over. It's actually quite the opposite. In the definition of meekness is implied authority. It's really authority under control. And so you have authority, but you don't exercise it in order to serve other people is the idea of what true meekness is. And then long-suffering or patience. And there's two Greek words for patience in Scripture. There's one that's patient or enduring in difficult situations. And then there's the other one, which is this one, is patient and enduring with difficult people. And so... Uh, when we're patient, that's given to us by the Lord as well. All three of those produce true unity. Then there's the question, well, where does that come from? 
And this is the flow of thought with Ephesians. The first three chapters of Ephesians is all a focus on Jesus, all that he's done, and who we are without him. We are, we are dead in our trespasses and sins, and it goes over all that Christ has done and accomplished for him. So that's the thought. Ephesians is Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. And then he transitions to us in verse chapter 4, verse 1. He says, because of Jesus, because of all these three chapters, he goes, therefore, I, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you to walk worthy of the calling with which you've been called. Then he gets into that with all lowliness, gentleness, long-suffering, and those things produce a unity that now we can keep a unity in the bond of peace. So when I focus on the Lord, it creates these things. When I'm focused on Jesus, it creates lowliness or humility. I see how weak I am, how in need I am compared to God, how little I am. I see his grace towards me, and so it makes me dependent on him. It also, when I am focused on Jesus, it makes me gentle. He's the ultimate example of authority under control, sacrificing himself on my behalf. So when I'm focused on him, it creates gentleness in me. Also, I'm very patient. After I look at the Lord and all he's done for me, it creates a great deal. I see how patient he was with me, and so I become patient with other people. And those things, again, create unity. Conversely, when I'm not focused on the Lord, I'm focused on myself, and the opposite happens. Instead of being lowly and dependent, I become arrogant and prideful. I become harsh and critical. I'm looking at myself opposed from God, and I think I'm pretty good, and I become self-focused. Instead of gentle, I use my authority and any power. I become harsh and critical. And instead of being patient, when I'm not focused on the Lord and focused on me, I'm very well, well aware of my desires and my what I think I deserve and my entitlements. I become very impatient with other people. So that's a good barometer. Have you been prideful, harsh, and impatient? It's probably because you're focused on you instead of the Lord. The quick fix is just get my eyes back on the Lord, start focusing on him. When I do, a natural byproduct of true time with the Lord is humility, gentleness, and patience with other people. So we are always able to gauge. Then when I'm walking in that and we're walking in that, we'll have unity among ourselves. And so that's where we see the one accord here. They're broken by the, the death and resurrection of Jesus. The next thing we see here, or I'm sorry, getting back to that, that, that thing, that humility is something, again, we need to walk in. We need to walk in unity that comes by humility, which comes by a focus on Jesus and not ourselves. So is there any division in your life? Is there any division that is in your control, an ought or a separation that is under your control you're holding on to because of pride, because of unforgiveness or bitterness or pain? Then that's something that you have control over. Focus on the Lord and allow the Lord to bring unity through your life. We see here that even Jesus' brothers now were present. He didn't seem to be, they didn't seem to be there when Jesus was walking the earth, but now all of a sudden they're there waiting in Jerusalem in kind of a hostile place, waiting in faith for this coming promise. What changed? The resurrection. The resurrection, again, is the proof of what Jesus did and who he was. And so it even brought his brothers now, got their attention to be waiting for the fulfillment of his word. Think about that for a moment. Jesus, God didn't have to include the resurrection in the gospel because the cross is where he paid for our sins. He could have just came, died for our sins, and that's it. Then his followers would have gone around saying, hey, Jesus died for your sins and you're forgiven. They would say, how do you know? Anybody could say that. So the resurrection really, as far as is for us, not as part of the gospel necessarily a necessity for the forgiveness of our sins, it was evident so that we could place our faith in what Jesus did on the cross. So it was a huge component of there. And so that's why it was included. And so it even testified to his own brothers and brought them into a relationship with him. The next thing, the third thing we see here is they prayed. They prayed. They were in prayer and supplication. Supplication just means intense requests for other people or other things. It doesn't tell us what they were praying for. But we can only guess it probably had to do with what Jesus had asked them to do and commissioned them to do. 
And so praying about the Holy Spirit, what's this going to look like? And come, Lord, are we ready? And the comfort and the witness that he shared, told them that they were to be to the world, the spreading of the kingdom, all these things. How are we going to do this, Lord? Give us wisdom. Give us understanding. And so probably pl- praying through what they were waiting for and preparing themselves. It's interesting because unity produces good corporate prayer, but good corporate prayer produces unity. It's kind of cyclical. And so if you want unity with other people, then one, you get your eyes off of you and on Jesus. Two, you pray for them. And three, you pray with them. If you really want to build a bond with someone, you start praying not only for them, but ask them to pray with you. Obviously, if they know the Lord, if they don't, then it probably won't be a place to bring together. But prayer, true prayer, you're transparent, you're intimate, intimate, and you're vulnerable. That's one of the best things that a married couple can do to continue to build a unity in their marriage is to often pray with one another because you're bearing your soul, things that you only typically share with God. That your deep concerns, your desires, the things that he's laying on your heart, the direction of your life, that should be your prayer life. And then when you include your spouse in there, it's a very unifying thing that you're bearing yourself. Many times when my wife is praying, I'm listening to what she's praying for, not only to agree with her, but to see what's on her heart and her mind. That way I understand her better and how I could pray and support her, and hopefully vice versa. And so praying with someone, you're essentially bearing yourselves before the Lord together, and it's a very intimate thing. And so you do that in marriage, but also, I think, in other healthy relationships that you're seeking to build, prayer is a very unifying thing. And so, again, unity produces good prayer, but also good prayer produces intense unity. The next thing we see is in verses 15 to 20. And in those days, Peter stood up in the midst of the disciples. Altogether, the number of the names was about 120, And said, men and brethren, this scripture had to be fulfilled, which the Holy Spirit spoke before by the mouth of David concerning Judas, who became a guide to those who arrested Jesus. For he was numbered with us and obtained a part in this ministry. Now this man purchased a field with the wages of iniquity, and falling headlong, he burst open in the middle, and all his entrails gushed out. And it became known to all those dwelling in Jerusalem that the field is called, in their own language, Akel Dama, that is, a field of blood. For it is written in the book of Psalms, Let his dwelling place be desolate, and let no one live in it, and let another take his office. So what's the fourth thing? Let our guts burst open before... No, I'm just kidding. (laughs) The word, right? They went to the word is the fourth thing. And so they were obedient, they were in humility and unity, they were praying and seeking the Lord, and the fourth thing, they went to the word together. They got a word for the situation. What does God say in principle or precept? And that's the same pattern for us as we look at our lives. This, these are four so far healthy things that we should be always engaged in, especially if we're seeking the will of the Lord. So as they were praying, as they were seeking the Lord, they were humble and united hearts, God gave them a specific scripture that was relevant about what was going on, the betrayer and the need to replace his office. Jesus chose 12 apostles to represent one from, they represented the 12 tribes of Israel, and they're really their restoration to be a witness to the world that they had lost. It's interesting to note For example, when James was martyred, not many chapters from now, they didn't seek a replacement for him. But something about Judas forsaking his office, he needed to be replaced. A new witness needed to be found to replace him. And so they sought a replacement for him. Some here would say, I used to think this as well, that, hey, they're in the flesh here. You know, the Holy Spirit hasn't descended. And we have a great picture of before Pentecost and after Pentecost. Men trying to do things in his own strength versus the choice that the Holy Spirit will make. And some would say, well, Paul was really the 12th disciple that the Holy Spirit ended up choosing. How that may be the case, but nothing in the text, nothing from the context says anything about that. This is not condemned. This is not corrected. It is just stated that this is what they did with no commentary. And you got to think, if anyone, if this was wrong, and if anyone would have said something, it would have been Luke. 
Luke was the traveling companion of Paul. Paul was like a hero to Luke. And so if it really was Paul, he would have made a little commentary here like they picked, they picked this guy, but they were wrong, right? It's really Paul. But he didn't say anything. He just wrote it down. This is what they're doing. And you got to look at what they're doing. Have they done anything fleshly so far? They've been in the word. They've been in humility and brokenness and unity and prayer and obedience. I, I don't see any flesh so far that would lead me to believe that they were acting in their own will here. You're all thinking like, yeah, wait till you get to the end when they're shooting dice, right? <laughs> we'll talk about that in just a moment here. And so again, they're doing everything good. Now we get to the fifth thing, verses 21 to 23. Therefore, of these men who have accompanied us all the time that the Lord Jesus went in and out among us, beginning from the baptism of John to the day when he was taken up from us, one of these must become a witness with us of his resurrection. And they proposed to Joseph called Barsabas, who was surnamed Justice, a lot of names there, and Matthias. And so these were the two guys. And so this is the fifth thing. And anybody catch anything in these verses as far as what was good that they did here? Okay, yeah, that, that was good. Right. Good. Okay. Yeah. So they uh, they picked it. What would we call this? What, what was something we could sum up as a good thing that they did when they did that? They prayed. Yeah. Grammy, you want to throw it out there? You, you're all boastful back there. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I got this. So, yeah. No, that's it. And so we're going to call this just godly wisdom or godly common sense. That's a byproduct now of everything that they've done up to this point. And so. We'll, we'll, let's look at this for just a second here. So is there a walking in obedience and unity and prayer, seeking God through his word? Now they got, it seemed, godly wisdom, a reconciliation of what was going on. They put everything together in kind of this natural, supernatural decision. Here they were called to be witnesses. They were told by Jesus, be witnesses to the uttermost parts of the world. The word said, they, they got a scripture, right, that helped reconcile one of their witnesses was missing someone would betray and then it says his dwelling would would not be inhabited again and so wow that was fulfilled he fell it became a field of blood no one ever inhabited it again and so that was fulfilled and then the ex next part of that is someone needs to take his office so somebody needs to take his office to be a witness that we were promised to be and again that fulfillment of the 12 that jesus called to be a redemption of the tribes of israel to be a witness to the world this doesn't seem to be the standard criteria for the rest of the New Testament. There's all kinds of apostles we're going to see through the rest of the New Testament. Paul, uh, Barnabas, Silas, they didn't have this criteria applied to them. But they were also not a witness in the same way that these 12 were witnesses in. And so they had a unique experience to be full witnesses of the entire life of Jesus Christ. So again, they're called to be witnesses. Well, who's going to be the best witness to testify? Someone who was there from the very beginning, from baptism, through his life and teaching, to his death on the cross, and then his resurrection. And so who could testify to the world that all those things transpired but someone who saw them all? And so that, that person's fit to take this place. So based on this, they had two candidates. And we look at this as well, practically. I could testify, this is how the Lord has spoke to me and many times, spoke, can I say that? Spoken to me many times in my life. We have the English teacher cringing over here. <laughs> um, and so spoke to me, and I'm sure many of you that same way. As you're walking in life, you're walking in humility and brokenness or seeking to, to uh, die to self, focus on the Lord, praying, you're in the word. And then there's times where the Lord just lines it all up. You go to the Lord, everything's confusing. There's all kinds of facts. And what should I do? What decisions should I make? I don't know. And then you go to the Lord, you calm down, 
You let the Holy Spirit kind of examine you, settle your thoughts. You get into the Word. He starts giving you scriptures that apply and start lining things up. Then all of a sudden, oh, wow, just all kind of, this is what we should do. This just lines up with what the Word is saying, with what God is telling me. And so he just kind of gives that godly common sense to make these decisions sometimes that he's calling you to do. And so we see that that's happening here. Then we get to the last thing here, verses 24 to 26. And they prayed. And said, you, O Lord, who know the hearts of all, show which of these two you have chosen to take part in this ministry and apostleship from which Judas by transgression fell that he might go to his own place. And then they cast their lots and the lot fell to Matthias and he was numbered with the 11 apostles. So this might be one where you're like, what? (laughs) Like they were doing so good right? They were praying and humble and in the word. And then it's almost like, okay, who brought the dice, (laughs) right? And so Jesus needs a new pair of disciples, right? And we're just casting it and just finding out where the dice lay. They committed everything great. And then it seems like a game of chance at the end to pick who would take the office. But this isn't what it looks like to us. It's not a game of chance to them. It was a practice of the Old Testament where they would cast lots. And this was the meaning behind it. It was them taking the decision out of their hands, they truly believed that God would direct the landing of the lot to his choice. So it was their way of taking themselves out of the decision making and putting it fully in God's hand. We're never directed to do this again in the New Testament. A major change in chapter two is we have the Holy Spirit now, who is that is the one that helps us to reconcile these things and speak to our hearts as far as these go. But The point is the same. There comes a point where we have to do the same thing, which is take ourselves out of the decision-making process. Just like they would cast the lots, that was their way of taking their hands off of it and letting God choose. The same for us, we have to remove ourselves and our wills from the process, coming to the place of really wanting God's will and not our own. And that's a huge part in making decisions. I read this once before, but I think it's huge. It's, the, it's a, um, the biography of George Mueller, and his life is a miraculous life of a man dedicated to intense prayer. If you ever want to be inspired in your walk with it, the Lord and your prayer life, pick this book up. It, it will really challenge you. But he was asked um, about his prayer life and the process he goes through in discovering God's will through prayer. And this is the first thing he said. He says, I seek at the beginning to get my heart into such a state that it has no will of its own in regard to a given matter. He said, nine-tenths of the difficulties are overcome when our hearts are ready to do the Lord's will, whatever it may be. When one is truly in this state, it is usually but a little way to the knowledge of what his will is. And so the biggest challenge a lot of times in our life is really coming to the place of, I really want your will. We could say that many times. Yeah, we want the Lord's will, but really I want my will, right? I'm really praying for this. I really want that. And I'm not really that in tune when I'm honest with myself because I want to hear what I want to hear. But when I truly can examine myself before the Lord and say, honestly, God, whatever you say, help me come to that place to be okay with it and getting our will out. And this is kind of that process of them casting the lots where we have to come to say, whatever your will is, I honestly want it to be done. And that's a critical part here of weeding through our motives. So as we wrap up here, let's look at the things that we covered today. The six things that we should do, but one even before that, that was really that attitude of the ascension, is that one, we should be walking around with that same focus, that twofold focus, that Jesus could come back at any time, And until then, we need to be submitting ourselves to the Holy Spirit within us to be witnesses to the world around us. And so is that really a priority, a focus, and a driving force in your life is the the, the reality of those two things? The next thing is we get into those six things is obedience. Are we doing what the Lord has called us to, to do today? Are we waiting to hear what he wants us to do tomorrow? So we want to be focused and obedient on what God has called us to do now. Are we dwelling in humility and unity? Are we dying to self, letting go of pride, and really seeking to dwell in unity and love with our brothers and sisters around us? Two, are we praying? 
and supplicating, intense requests? Are we, are we faithful in praying and seeking God's will? Remember, prayer isn't about manipulating God. Prayer is usually about getting my will submitted to his. And so as we're praying, when they were praying for the coming of the Holy Spirit, the, con the commission to share, be a witness around the world, to make disciples, it was God, it was about them being changed and molded and prepared for the work that God had for them. Are we in the word? Are we faithfully in his word in general reading it, but also waiting for that specific scriptures that are applicable to the situation that we're dealing with? Are we going to his word? Are we relying and listening to the Holy Spirit for that wisdom that he gives to reconcile and line these things up and being honest? And are we emptying our will? Are we really putting things in God's hands and allowing him to direct us wherever he wants to do? And so I think those are good things that we could be doing, especially when we're seeking the direction and the will of God for our lives. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. So, Lord, we thank you again for your goodness. We thank you for your love. We thank you for these practical things, Lord, that you give us in our lives uh, to help direct and guide us. And so, Father, I do pray that, Lord, each of us, one, that just that mentality, that attitude, that focus, Lord, that we truly would be expecting your imminent return at any time, but at the same time, knowing that the, the surpassing greatness, the power that rose Christ from the dead is living in us that have received Jesus. That power enables us to change and to obey, and Lord, it enables us to be a witness. You want to do miraculous things through us. Again, are we walking around saying, what crazy thing do you want to do today, God? Are you going to show up in a powerful way and touch and change and speak and do things? That we would be walking around with that, Lord, that expectation. And then, Lord, I just also pray practically about obedience and humility and unity and prayer, our time in the word, all these things that just should be a daily part of our lives, not out of, out of obligation, not out of a laundry list of things to do, but out of a true interaction, relationship, and love relationship with you, God. So I pray you direct our paths, and you do great things in and through each of our lives. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right, let's sing, stand, and we'll sing this last song. God bless you. Have a glorious Sunday.